Good afternoon, and welcome to our virtual town hall. During this session, we'll answer your questions and provide trustworthy information about the COVID vaccines. I'm Dr. Lainey Rutko, a professor in the Bloomberg School of Public Health and senior advisor to President Ron Daniels. I serve as one of the team members leading our COVID planning efforts. I'm delighted to be moderating today's session, and I'm joined by my colleagues Heidi Conway, Vice President of Human Resources, and Dr. Bill Moss, Professor in the Bloomberg School of Public Health and Executive Director of the International Vaccine Access Center. Before Bill's opening remarks, I want to mention the Johns Hopkins Get the Facts about the Vax campaign. For those of you on campus, you've hopefully seen materials related to this effort. It is a great resource for clear and accurate information. The campaign focuses on how we can all protect ourselves and protect each other during the COVID pandemic. Getting the COVID vaccine is a key way to keep both ourselves and our community safe. In our announcement for this session, we ask that you please send us questions beforehand and we appreciate the many that we've received. We'll be providing answers in real time. So please submit your questions in the box at the bottom of the screen. And I'll be keeping my eye on that Q and A, um, those, those questions coming in throughout the session. So please don't hesitate to send in your questions. You'll also see a banner on your screen during this session, and it will take you to a brief anonymous survey. Your answers to this voluntary survey will help us to better understand your concerns about vaccines. This town hall is being recorded and it will be available for asynchronous viewing. I'm now going to turn to Bill, who will give us some opening remarks about the COVID vaccines. Bill, over to you. Lainey, thank you very much. And it's my great pleasure to join Heidi Conway in, uh, in this virtual town hall and to try to uh, address uh, the questions of, the, of our listeners. So I'm just gonna start off by saying a few words about uh, COVID-19 vaccines, just to cover some of the, the basic material. And I thought I'd start off first by talking a little bit about how vaccines work in general and the COVID-19 vaccine uh, specifically. So our immune system has developed and evolved to recognize infectious diseases, infectious pathogens um, that enter our body and to fight those off uh, and prevent disease. And our immune system has also evolved to develop what we call memory immune responses. So that after we've been infected with a particular pathogen or been vaccinated against a particular disease, our immune systems remember uh, that particular pathogen. And the next time we see it, or the next time we're exposed to a, vac uh, a virus, um, we develop a, a very strong uh, immune response. And there are really two components to our, uh, our, immune, our protective immune response. One are, is our cellular immunity. And we have both T cells and B cells. T cells help kill infected, uh, infected cells. And then B cells make, our, make the antibodies that can help neutralize the virus. And that's the second aspect of our immune, of, of our immune response. These are antibodies or proteins uh, that hang out in our, in our blood and should we be exposed to uh, that infectious agent again, they're ready to help uh, fight that infection. So what we're doing with vaccines is really training our immune system um, in a way that where we do not develop the disease, but should we see that infection, infectious pathogen again, our immune systems are ready to fight it. And so what's happening with the COVID-19 vaccines, and they all really have the same kind of mechanism, is we're training our immune system to, to recognize and fight uh, the spike protein of the SARS coronavirus 2, which is the virus that causes COVID-19. And that spike protein is the, is the protein on the surface of the virus that allows the virus to bind to our cells and enter our cells and replicate. So all of the COVID-19 vaccines are really uh, training our immune system to recognize and fight that spike protein of SARS coronavirus 2. Now they do this in different ways and there are different ways vaccines can work. Uh, some vaccines use uh, what we call attenuated viruses, like, like our measles vaccine or our rubella vaccines. Um, basically, uh, uh, 
what's injected or what the vaccine is, is a weakened form of that virus. That virus replicates a little bit in our bodies and then stimulates uh, and, uh, the, our immune system and trains our immune system to fight that virus. Now, we don't currently have any attenuated COVID-19 uh, vaccines. Um, so another way to, to train our immune system is to uh, kill the virus, um, make it so it doesn't can't replicate, and then inject that. And there are some COVID-19 vaccines that do that, although they're not uh, being currently used in the United States. Um, some of the vaccines that have been manufactured in China, for example, use these inactivated viral vaccines. A third approach is to just take that spike protein. Um, forget about the rest of the virus. We just take that spike protein and you inject the spike protein and that then trains our immune system uh, to recognize and fight SARS coronavirus too. Now we may see that vaccine in the United States in the coming months. There's a company called Novavax that creates that kind of vaccine, that protein-based vaccine, but not yet. So what are we using now? A, a fourth way of uh, basically training our immune system is to inject not the virus or a protein, but actually the genetic recipe so that our own cells create uh, that protein. And that's what we're doing with the adenovirus vectored vaccine, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And that's exactly how the messenger RNA vaccines, the Pfizer or Moderna vaccines work. Both of those, they work through different mechanisms, but both of those uh, are, are providing the genetic recipe for the spike protein. Our own cells, our own muscle cells create that protein, and then our immune system recognizes and responds to that. So how were these uh, messenger RNA and adenovirus vector uh, vaccines developed, and how do we know that they're safe and effective? Um, they, I want people to understand that there are decades of research that are behind these vaccines. These vaccines just didn't come out of the blue. There was a lot of work on mRNA vaccines and adenovirus vectored vaccines uh, long before the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so when the pandemic hit, scientists and, and vaccine manufacturers were really poised. They were ready uh, to take these technologies, which had a lot of work behind them, and develop these new uh, vaccines for SARS coronavirus too. As soon as we knew the, the genetic code for the spike protein, these types of vaccines could be manufactured. And then they underwent very rigorous evaluation. There was there were no steps that were skipped uh, in evaluating both the safety and the efficacy of these vaccines. So the Pfizer, the Moderna, the Johnson & Johnson all went through early phase one testing, really looking at safety and dosage, phase two testing and larger numbers of individuals, again, looking at safety and immunogenicity, how our immune responses to the vaccines. And then lastly, the large phase three trials that included tens of thousands of participants, again, looking at safety. And here we, uh, we were able to look at the efficacy of these vaccines. And for the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine, this was remarkable. 95% uh, protective efficacy in the early results of the phase three trials. And that's what led to the Food and Drug Administration issuing emergency use authorizations. And I think we need to pause and reflect how fortunate we are at this stage in the pandemic to have these highly safe and effective vaccines. Just try to imagine what our lives would be like right now if we didn't have these vaccines. Um, now, these vaccines do have side effects. Um, some of this was learned uh, during the phase three trials, and some of this was learned afterward. In the phase three trials, we learned, for example, that the Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson vaccine cause what we call reactogenicity. This is local inflammation at the site of injection, the soreness, redness, uh, tenderness at the site of injection, and some systemic inflammation, the fever, headaches, 
muscle aches, fatigue, uh, that many people get 12 to 36 hours after vaccination. Um, that's what we learned from the phase three trials. Now the phase three trials won't tell us about rarer adverse events or rarer side effects. So shortly after these vaccines were kind of rolled out globally, we learned that some individuals, maybe one in 100,000, uh, will get uh, a severe allergic reaction very shortly, within a half hour, Hour after vaccination. Um, and for this reason, uh, those in our audience who've been vaccinated, hopefully most of them, uh, know that you're asked to sit around for 15 or 30 minutes just to make sure you don't develop uh, one of those more severe allergic reactions. Those are treatable. Uh, medical personnel are out at site, uh, at these vaccination sites to treat those adverse events. Now, more recently, uh, many all of our listeners would know there, there's been even a, a rarer adverse event that's been associated with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, also with the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is not yet uh, authorized for use in the United States. And these are these severe blood clots that occur maybe in about one in a million uh, uh, vaccine recipients. Um, it's a, a peculiar uh, or unusual type of, of clotting disorder what we call thrombosis with low platelet counts or thrombosis uh, with thrombocytopenia. And what's been very concerning is that some people have developed these blood clots in the veins and the brain, and that's obviously very severe, and three people have died. This So far in the United States with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, with more than 8 million people vaccinated, 17 cases of these uh, severe, uh, this severe condition called uh, thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome syndrome have been identified. Now, Lainey, there are still many things that are that we don't know about these vaccines. So, for example, we don't quite know yet uh, the duration of protection. We just need to follow people out uh, for longer. And so we don't quite know yet the need for booster doses, and we can talk more about that. We're learning more about vaccination uh, during pregnancy. Uh, we know that COVID-19 can be very severe in, in pregnant women, um, and we've already learned that that it, it looks like uh, these vaccines are safe uh, in pregnant for both pregnant women and for their uh, their offspring. We're still learning about the safety and efficacy of these vaccines in children, but we have good data now, preliminary data, that these vaccines are safe and highly protective in uh, in at least children uh, 12 years of old uh, of age and older. And we're learning more about these vaccines uh, in younger children. So I'll stop there, Lainey, with that kind of overview uh, of COVID-19 vaccines, and we can move to the, the questions and answers. Thanks so much, Bill. And I want to thank everyone who submitted questions so far. I'm actively keeping my eye on your questions. Please continue to submit them throughout this town hall if you think of additional um, questions as, as you hear Bill and Heidi speaking. I also, before I turn to the questions, want to remind everyone, you'll see a banner on your screen throughout this briefing. If you click on it, it will take you to a very brief anonymous, of course, voluntary survey that will help us to better understand your concerns about vaccines. And now I'm going to turn to the questions that, that we've been receiving. So Bill, I'm gonna start with questions for you about the vaccine itself. First is for those who are fully vaccinated, can they still get COVID? Yeah, so uh, Lainey, as you, as you know, this is a, a commonly asked question and a very important question. And the bottom line is these vaccines, as good as they are, are not perfect. They're not 100% protective. I referred earlier to that 95% vaccine efficacy in the phase three trials. What that means is that uh, there are a small proportion of people, in that case 5%, um, who are still likely to get disease. So uh, the vaccines are not 100% protective, um, but they are high, even more highly protective against severe disease, hospitalizations and deaths. And that's very important for people to understand. So uh, a vaccinated individual can rarely uh, get COVID-19, but they're, they're, it would be very unusual for them to get uh, severe disease, be hospitalized and die. It can happen, but very rare. Thanks, Bill. Another question for you. This is actually um, several questions related to for um, to this topic. So for those who know that they've already had 
COVID, should they should they then get vaccinated? And knowing that that there may be some side effects, you know, associated with with vaccination, why take that risk if you've already know that you had COVID? Yeah. So this too is a very important question, and the the current uh, guidelines from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention are that people who've had a prior history of COVID-19 should be vaccinated. And the reason, Lainey, is that the immune response to a natural infection is quite variable. Some people develop a, a strong immune response, but many don't. Um, and we have seen reinfections among people who've had COVID-19. We know a lot more about the immune response to the vaccines we know that they are very highly protective. And so because of that variability in the immune response to natural infection and the, uh, the high protection that's conferred uh, by the vaccines, it is recommended that people who've had COVID-19 uh, be fully vaccinated to ensure uh, their protection. Thanks, Bill. Another topic that's coming up a lot in the questions coming in concerns fertility. Mm -hmm. especially for um, women or or um, those who are much younger that think in the coming years they they want to have children. So what do we know about these vaccines and fertility? Yes. So um, I will say, you know, there there is more to be known uh, about this, but I want to reassure uh, women who are pregnant or thinking about being pre getting pregnant, uh, that there's no evidence that uh, any of these vaccines impact fertility. Now, uh, what we do know, um, first of all, uh, pregnant women were deliberately excluded from the phase three trials. This is very commonly done uh, in uh, vaccine trials, not to include pregnant women, at least initially. Um, but we do know that COVID-19 is a, a very, can be a very severe disease uh, in pregnant women. Um, they are uh, several times more likely uh, to uh, develop severe disease um, and to uh, end up in an intensive care unit than, uh, than women who are not pregnant. Um, so the, the disease itself is more severe in pregnancy. Um, we do know from uh, uh, monitoring, safety monitoring, after these vaccines have been uh, rolled out in the United States and, you know, uh, more than uh, 150 million doses in the, or people vaccinated in the United States, um, millions of people vaccinated worldwide. Um, there have been pregnant women who've received these vaccines and the CDC recently, uh, recently um, summarized uh, safety data in more than 36,000 pregnant women uh, who received the vaccine. So tens of thousands of women in the United States have been vaccinated. Um, uh, they looked at uh, adverse events in those women, uh, interestingly, um, more likely to get sore arms uh, than uh, uh, women who are not pregnant. Um, but and they've, the CDC has also followed close to th uh, 4,000 uh, women in, in a program they call V Safe, uh, where they have these uh, monitor pregnancy outcomes and uh, potential adverse events among pregnant women, and they aren't seeing any uh, unusual safety signals either in the pregnant women or their or, or their offspring. So right now, uh, the data that we have is that these vaccines are safe uh, in pregnant women and that they don't have any impact uh, on fertility. Thanks, Bill. Another question for you. How long does immunity last and does it depend on which vaccine you get? Yeah, so this too is a very important question and we're still learning about this. So obviously we're we're relatively, uh, this is a new vaccine. Um, we only in here in the United States started, started vaccinating people in mid-December. Um, so we really don't know the, the full duration of protective immunity. What we do know is that both uh, for the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine, uh, uh, those manufacturers have issued preliminary findings uh, of six months of follow-up in the phase three trials. Um, for Pfizer, for example, it looked like the protective efficacy was about 91% uh, at six months, maybe down slightly from the 
5% uh, uh, in the, from the earlier results, but it looks like these vaccines have remained highly protective at least six months out. Um, and so we're just gonna need to see uh, how long the protective immunity uh, lasts, and we're gonna need to see it for different vaccines. There may be some differences uh, across vaccine platforms. I don't anticipate there'll be major differences uh, between say the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines that both use the mRNA technology, but potentially some differences with an adenovirus vector vaccine. And obviously the, the J&J vaccine is just a single dose. Uh, so uh, there could be differences in the duration of protective immunity. Uh, we're going to have to see, and, and that's obviously going to drive the need for booster doses. And Bill, speaking of, of booster doses, I want to piggyback on what uh, what you were just saying with with a few questions, and we're getting several several questions that relate to to boosters. So, what do you anticipate will be the need for for boosters, and and roughly what do you think the time frame will be? Yeah. So I, uh, first I'll say, Lainey, that there are uh, different reasons for booster doses, um, and there are different strategies for booster doses. Um, the two driving factors are, uh, you know, the what we call waning immunity, basically what we were just talking about, the duration of protective immunity. Um, but another reason for at least additional doses, I'll, I'll distinguish additional doses from booster doses, um, are uh, the emergence of variants. Uh, variants of concern uh, for which our current vaccines have reduced efficacy. Um, right now, the evidence suggests that our current vaccines uh, are highly effective against the current, uh, the, the variants of concern. Um, there may be some reduced efficacy with some vaccines against some variants, um, but uh, overall, the protective efficacy remains high, and particularly for severe disease, which is what we're most concerned about. So what could additional doses look like? Additional, uh, a true booster dose is, is where you administer the same vaccine uh, again. And so this would be primarily uh, for uh, waning immunity, but we, but we know that there is some cross protection. And so one could also use a, a booster dose with the same vaccine uh, to help uh, increase the, the level of neutralizing antibodies and provide protection against some of these variants of concern. Um, one could uh, also see additional doses that, that have either uh, a, a new vaccine, basically where we take the MR, the, the Pfizer, Moderna vaccine, or even the J&J &J vaccine, and alter that, that genetic recipe for the spike protein so that it uh, 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 contains the genetic recipe for, one, for the spike protein for one of these variants of concern. Or we could see uh, what we, uh, you know, m basically mixed vaccines that have the genetic recipe for the original uh, viral variant and for uh, a new variant. And the vaccine manufacturers are working on all these different strategies. Uh, now that, you know, so that for the variants, that's going to be driven by, you know, the uh, immunity escaped uh, if we start seeing that this uh, if we start seeing variants that are really uh, avoiding the, the protection um, the duration of immunity again I'm not I'm not quite clear sure right now what that's going to be I know the the CEO of Pfizer came out and and you know kind of made a claim that we may need uh, booster doses in the coming in the coming months I know Moderna is working on that as well um, I think we'll just have to see. Uh, I don't anticipate that it'll be in the coming months. Uh, people will need to get a third dose. I hope we can uh, maintain our focus on just increasing uh, vaccination with the first and second doses. Um, but it may be, uh, you know, in a year, it may be a couple of years, uh, depending upon that duration of immunity, uh, when people will need booster doses. I know I'm not directly answering the question, but I think we still need to learn more about that duration of immunity. Thanks very much, Bill. And I'm going to turn to Heidi now, but Bill, I'm sure you and I will see each other again during this town hall. So Heidi, some questions for you about um, university policy and, and procedures. Who is being mandated for the COVID vaccine and will exemptions be granted? Lainey, thank you. I appreciate being here um, with Bill. Um, 
for now, all JHU undergraduate and graduate students who will be on campus attending classes, performing duties, and or uh, participating in on-campus activities will be required to show documentation um, of receipt of a COVID vaccine or um, receive an exemption. And just to say a little bit um, about exemptions and how they will work, um, an exemption policy will be developed and is being considered, um, but we anticipate that we will use procedures similar to those that we have um, used for the mandatory flu vaccinations. And this includes first, uh, for medical reasons, uh, an exemption might apply as defined by the most uh, current recommendations for the CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. An example of this would be um, a potential of a severe allergy um, to the vaccine. And then the second reason would be a religious exemption. Um, further, women who are pregnant or bre breastfeeding, as you heard Bill talk about, may also request um, an exemption. Um, the process for the medical and religious exemption is being determined, um, as I mentioned, and will be announced by the end of the spring semester. Thanks, Heidi. And to, to piggyback on what you were just saying, for students who are, do not get vaccinated and do not qualify for an exemption, what will happen? So students who do not um, qualify for an exemption are required and will be on campus um, or participating in on-campus activities will be required to have the vaccination to be on campus and um, will not be allowed to be on campus and will have to um, go through uh, virtual um, learning. Thanks, Heidi. And um, one more um process related question for you. Is there a, a way for individuals to let the university know that they have been fully vaccinated? Lainey, that's a great question. Um, and we are um, in the process of developing um, a user friendly way for students and for um, employees and faculty uh, to um, to show that they have been um, immunized. For now, I would say hang on to your immunization um, record. Uh, we will have a process very similar to how the flu worked and how you documented the flu vaccine where you can upload um, your uh, documentation. Thanks, Heidi. Bill, I predicted we would see each other again. I'm going to, I'm going to turn back to you um, now as I see more questions coming in. So Bill, one question for you is, can you talk about the, the difference between the EUA, the emergency use authorization that um, is currently the status of the Moderna, Pfizer, and J&J &J vaccines, and the difference between that and full FDA approval? Yes. Um, so uh, the emergency use authorization is something that the Food and Drug Administration um, can uh, uh, authorize um, in, in emergency uh, settings. Um, so let me unpack that a little. I, I was, uh, <laughs> um, so there, the, the amount of the data um, and evidence that a vaccine manufacturer needs to provide the Food and Drug Administration is less. Um, they still obviously want to ensure as best they can uh, the safety and efficacy of the vaccine, and they did that very rigorously. Um, but uh, for example, the duration of follow-up in a phase three trial um, can be uh, less uh, than for an emergency use authorization. And so it, the EUAs are issued uh, as in this case, in the midst of a terrible pandemic, when there are no other really options available and where the evidence uh, at that uh, time uh, and uh, suggests that this is gonna be a far greater, greater benefit than risk. Um, so 
it, to get to what's called a biological license application, which is the next step uh, that the pharmaceutical uh, companies need to do, um, is that they accrue longer follow-up. Uh, for example, this, uh, basically what happened with the emergency use authorizations is they required that at least half the participants have at least two months of follow-up time. Now they're looking at six months of follow-up time. Now we know that most adverse events associated with vaccines occur in that two-month period. Um, it is unusual to start seeing uh, adverse events uh, after two months after vaccination, but it's still very important. There may be some rare adverse events that show up in that time. So the, the vaccine manufacturers, Pfizer and Moderna, for example, are accruing that additional follow-up time uh, looking at safety, uh, continuing to look at efficacy, um, and there's a, a, a longer uh, review process for the full biological license application, um, and, and that can sometimes take six months or, or so, even when the, it's prioritized. Um, but what ha basically the bottom line is uh, we did not want to wait for that full biological licensure application uh, and review process to take place um, before issuing the, before start using these vaccines basically in the United States given this, the terrible state of the pandemic. Um, so I anticipate that in the, in the coming months, I, I know the, the, the pharmaceutical companies, Pfizer and Moderna, have not really released the, their timelines on this, um, but I, I'm hopeful that in the, in the next few months, we'll, we'll see these vaccines uh, fully approved. Thanks, Bill. You, you anticipated my next question about trying, trying to um, determine when that that approval is likely to happen. And I think it, it, it's very important for, for people. Uh, you know, for some people, um, there may be, there are, are there are people who may be hesitant to get the vaccine under the emergency use authorization. Um, so it does have implications. And I, I know it's very important for people. And again, hopeful we'll, we'll see this in the coming months. Thanks, Bill. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna um, stick with you for for a little bit now with some additional questions about the the vaccines. What do we know for those who are undergoing um, different types of medical treatments or procedures? Um, one example that I've seen come in is, is chemotherapy. What do we know about that in terms of COVID vaccination? Right. So. Um... There are two obviously there are two issues that one needs to think about uh, in giving a vaccine to anyone, but particularly those who are receiving, say, immunosuppressive therapy. You know, one is the safety of the vaccine, and the other is uh, how effective the vaccine is going to be. Um, as we've talked about, these are these are not uh, live viral vaccines. We are, we do have concerns about giving live viral vaccines like a measles, rubella, mumps vaccine uh, to immunocompromised persons, and we and we deliberately avoid doing so. Um, there is no there are no particular reasons to be concerned about the the safety of either the mRNA vaccines or the adenoviral vector vaccines because they don't replicate. Uh, in, in people, and so we're not concerned about that particular safety aspect in immunocompromised people. Um, as Heidi said, the the only contraindications uh, for, say, the mRNA vaccines are severe allergic reactions, uh, either severe allergic reactions to a per, to prior receipt of the vaccine or a component of the vaccine. Um, so what we're, what our concerns are with uh, people who are receiving immunosuppressive therapy is whether or not these vaccines really will confer the protection um, uh, that we expect from them. And so people who are on uh, highly immunosuppressive regimens for a short time, um, it may be best in consultate, they should do this in consultation with their physician, um, but to not get vaccinated while they're severely Im immunosuppressed, ideally get vaccinated before that, um, or delay vaccination until they come off severe immunosuppressive therapy. Obviously, people who are severely immunosuppressed are, are at higher risk of severe COVID. Um, so that risk-benefit trade-off needs to be very carefully evaluated in consultation with their physician. Um, but the, the real concern, and maybe the short answer then, Lainey, to that question is, um, we don't have 
have uh, at, at the present time safety concerns about these vaccines. It could be that these vaccines are less protective uh, when administered to people receiving immunosuppressive therapy. Thanks, Bill. I'm also seeing several questions come in about um, mixing and matching doses. So for the two dose vaccines for Pfizer and, and Moderna, but also in anticipation of, of a booster. And I know you taught me um, the, the technical term for this one, remembering, I think it's heter heterologous. Yes. Something, something close to that. So what, what are your thoughts about this, this mix and match, both for the, yeah. the current regimen, but with an eye towards boosters as well? Yeah. So again, uh, uh, to quote Tony Fauci and others, we want to follow the, the science. Um, and so the phase three trials uh, uh, really were with the same vaccine. The second dose was with this, the same vaccine. So that's what we know best. That's for that we have the best evidence on both the safety and efficacy of these vaccines when it's the same dose, the same vaccine given for the first and, and, and second dose. Now, uh, the CDC has recognized that uh, that uh, in some rare situations, uh, someone uh, may receive a Pfizer or Moderna vaccine, and then when they return, that vaccine may not be available. So they do allow, the, C the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention does allow in exceptional circumstances when uh, the first vaccine is not available to get uh, a different mRNA vaccine for the second. So that would be swapping out a Pfizer or Moderna, you know, for the second dose. We know less uh, about if, if you, uh, if a person actually changes vaccine platforms, you know, gets an mRNA vaccine and then an adenovirus vectored vaccine. It's, it's you know, my, my speculation would be that that's safe um, and that the person would still have, uh, you know, uh, an enhanced immune response with that other vaccine type of vaccine, but we don't know. We don't have good evidence uh, for that. There are ongoing trials in different parts of the world uh, looking at this heterologous uh, vaccination uh, uh, strategy. Um, and some people think that there, you know, there may be potential advantages for that. Um, and in the history of vaccinology, uh, that has been explored. Um, something called a prime boost strategy, where you use different vaccines, a, a particular pl vaccine platform to prime the immune system, and then a different vaccine to boost the immune system. So, the, but the bottom line, Laney, is is at this point in time, we know the best, uh, we have the best evidence um, for when a person receives the same vaccine for the first and second doses. I, I think we'll learn more going forward about what, what happens if you mix and mesh. And we recognize that there are some uh, exceptional circumstances where a person who uh, may need to swap out the mRNA vaccine, that's a Pfizer or Moderna vaccine for the first and second doses. Those vaccines are so similar that we expect uh, them to act uh, in a similar way. Thanks, Bill. One more question for you, and then I'll turn to Heidi. So we now have three um, three EUA vaccines in, in the U.S., Pfizer, Moderna, and J&J. &J. Does one confer better immunity? So se several folks are asking, you know, if we get to a point where there's, where there's a choice, how do you make the choice? Yeah. Um, and I, I think, to be honest, Lainey, we, we are perhaps getting to a point where where people will have a choice you know the public health mess messaging and and I agreed with it early on is you get you know people should get the vaccine that's available to them uh, you know and and we know that these all three vaccines uh, the Pfizer moderna and, and Johnson and Johnson are all highly protective uh, against severe disease. And that's really our, our main goal is preventing hospitalizations and preventing deaths. Um, so when one looks at it with that perspective, you know, th they are equivalent. Now in the phase three trials, we did see lower vaccine efficacy with the Johnson & Johnson uh, vaccine compared to the uh, Pfizer and Moderna, um, but it's important to point out that that vaccine was evaluated at a different phase uh, in the 
pandemic, when we had more uh, variants of concern uh, circulating, uh, particularly uh, in South Africa, for example, where, their va where that vaccine was evaluated. So if one looks uh, just at the vaccine efficacy data, one does see differences. Now there are, uh, you know, strong, uh, there are reasons why the Johnson & Johnson vaccine may be preferred, um, obviously single dose, uh, and that's, uh, that's desirable to some individuals. Um, they may want, they, they may have some fear of, of needles and getting vaccinated. They may have some concerns about the side effects after a second dose. And for many people, it's just much more convenient to, to go with a one dose vaccine rather than the two dose vaccines. Um, you know, in terms of, so there, I, I think we will get to a, a point where people will have more choice, particularly as we see supply outstrip demand. Um, and uh, just to come back to the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, Scene. Um, I mentioned the, the thrombosis with thr thrombocytopenia syndrome. And so women uh, between the ages of 18 and, and 50 um, may want to think about uh, if they have an option uh, about preferring a Pfizer or Moderna vaccine where we have not seen that clotting disorder. Um, and I think that in my view, that's a very reasonable uh, uh, choice. Thanks, Bill. Heidi, I'm, I'm going to turn to you now for some um, university specific questions. First is what's, what's your advice to those that are seeking to access the vaccine right now, either um, you know, within or, or beyond Johns Hopkins? Sure, Lainey, thank you for that. Um, and I'm happy to share that the university is um, seeking opportunities for on-campus vaccination. But for now, you will need to seek back vaccination through um, the state, your local juris jurisdiction, a pharmacy, or a healthcare provider. Um, and I want to mention as well, Johns Hopkins Medicine is providing vaccination to all Hopkins affiliates in Maryland and Washington, D.C. Um, as, it, as its allocation of vaccine um, supply from the state allows. You can register through my chart. Um, and another opportunity is the Baltimore Convention Center is um, currently providing walk-up service for the Pfizer vaccine six days a week, uh, Monday through Saturday from 10 to one. So anybody who's um, seeking just easy access to the vaccine, I would guide you to the Baltimore Convention Center um, um, for the Pfizer vac vaccine six days a week from 10 to one. Thanks, Heidi. Another question for you um, specific to, to the university. Once folks are fully vaccinated, will they still be expected to comply with other mitigation and safety measures? So that's a really, really good question. And the um, short answer is yes. Um, given the still evolving understanding of the science related to these vaccines and the op operational difficulty of enforcing different rules for different people in our community, we are not relaxing any of our COVID safety protocols at this time based on individuals' vaccination status. We do have a robust, uh, we do have robust evidence um, that all three vaccines that have been approved in the US provide strong protection against severe symptoms of COVID and consequently, consequently hospitalizations and death from the virus. Um, uh, however, we do not have yet have enough information to say with certainty whether they prevent mild symptoms, transmission of the virus or infection. So we are not relaxing um, any of our protocols um, at this time. Thanks, Heidi. And lots of questions coming in about the, um, the current thinking in terms of mandating COVID vaccine for faculty and staff. Of course, you already talked about students, but could, could you speak to the current thinking for faculty and staff? Sure. So um, we have not made any decisions um, about the faculty or staff at this point. I will say, um, similar to the flu vaccine, it is likely you will see um, the vaccine mandated and we will be communicating with our community. But again, 
no um, decisions have been made about faculty and staff. Thanks, Heidi. Bill, I'm gonna turn back to you now. And um, several questions about what happens once you get the vaccine. So if you if you get your COVID vaccine, um, one dose of J and J or two if it's Pfizer or Moderna, and nothing happens, mm -hmm. can you feel confident that it worked? Yes, um, and so the answer is yes, Lainey. You uh, you um, people who do not have the the side effects that we talked about, you know, the the sore arm or the fever, headache or fatigue, um, still uh, develop, you know, highly protective immune responses. And the way I kind of think about this is that there are kind of different aspects of our immune response that are responsible for those two uh, aspects. Um, there's uh, our innate immune uh, system that uh, responds early and that is largely the cause of those local reactions or those systemic reactions that we get 12 to 36 or 48 hours after vaccination. Um, and so people who develop those side effects, we often say, yeah, this is a sign of your immune system working. Um, and it is, um, but it doesn't mean that those people who don't get a side uh, uh, those side effects that they're not developing the, their protective immune response that are they're part of what we call the adaptive immune response as opposed to the innate immune response. And so people who do not, who, who those lucky ones uh, who don't get those severe side effects, they too uh, are protected uh, equally by, by the vaccine. Thanks, Bill. And um, a follow-up question. Can you explain why those side effects do happen to some people if there's no live virus involved here? Yeah. So the the fact that it's not a, a, a live virus, that, that uh, these are not live viral vaccines or replication replicating viral vaccines, um, the, it, it's still a, a foreign, uh, the way we use the term foreign, um, but still, you know, uh, a, a, a substance uh, that's not part of our our own cells, and so our immune system recognize it as not part of ourself, um, and so that uh, it's that that feature of it, whether it's replicating or or not, or, or you know a live virus or not, um, it's still this kind of foreign substance, if I can use that term, um, that our immune system is is recognizing and responding to, uh, and that our imu innate immune system is seeing and and causing that that uh, that local swelling and tenderness and and the fever and fatigue and headaches. Thanks, Bill. And another topic where I'm seeing several questions um, come in, and I know this is on a lot of people's mind. Once you're fully vaccinated, can you still transmit the virus to others, especially to those who are not yet vaccinated? Yes, and this this loops back to a point that Heidi made uh, earlier, and so th the answer is yes. Uh, someone who is fully vaccinated can still get infected. Uh, they can still develop uh, symptoms, um, uh, but their risk is much much lower. Um, their risk of severe disease is is extremely low. Um, their risk of mild infection is 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 lower, um, and their risk of becoming infected and and transmitting the virus is, is low. Um, so the 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 answer is that uh, people who are fully vaccinated can um, get infected with SARS coronavirus too. Um, we're there are still ongoing studies about their ab ability to to transmit the virus, but I would assume that there is the potential for them to transmit the virus. The way I think about it is that if you're fully vaccinated, your risk of doing so is just so much less, uh, so much lower risk uh, than someone who's unvaccinated. Thanks, Bill. Heidi, question for you. Since you mentioned in your remarks a moment ago, um, the strong um, consideration about um, COVID vaccines and, and mandating for faculty and staff. 
what what do you anticipate the process will be in terms of exemptions? So um, when we think about exemptions, um, I think I mentioned to you um, earlier that you know there are two um, types of exemptions that we would consider. Um, one would be for medical reasons, um, and the second would be religious. And you would go through a similar process as you do today for the flu. Um, and um, that process is currently through um, the Office of Institutional Equity. So you would reach out to either your HR person or directly to Institutional Equity and, um, and go through uh, the process of um, you know, documentate, documenting um, your situation with them. I would say if you don't qualify, because I know we are thinking about that as well, if you, if you don't qualify for um, the, um, for the exemption and, um, you know, the vaccine is required, we will work hard to go through a process of kind of education and um, also kind of suggest opportunities for you to learn more about the vaccine to gain um, a level of comfort. Um, but, you know, if you are a student um, and you do not have the vaccine, you will not you know, be allowed on campus activities or um, on campus learning. And the same would be for a faculty or a staff member if we were to require um, the vaccine. And again, we have not made a decision for our faculty and staff, um, but we, we are strongly considering it at this time. Thanks, Heidi. Bill, in our last few minutes of this town hall, I'm, I'm gonna turn back to you with, um, additional questions that, that are coming in. Several questions about children. So what's being done right now to learn about the COVID vaccines in kids? And um, when do you anticipate that COVID vaccines may be available for children? Yes, really important issue, Lainey, um, to, for parents and children. Um, so right now, uh, well, the way the way vaccines are studied in children, and this is very typical, and this is what's happening with the COVID-19 vaccines, is something we call age de-escalation. And so the vaccine studies are, are first done in, in adults, uh, and then we move to adolescents, and then we move to younger and younger children. And that's kind of the standard process uh, for understanding both the safety and the efficacy of vaccines in children. So right now, now, both for Pfizer and Moderna, um, they have uh, uh, completed, uh, you know, part of the, their their studies of uh, COVID-19 vaccines in children uh, for Pfizer, fifth, uh, I'm sorry, 12 to 16 years of age, for Mater Moderna, 12 to 18 years of age. Um, we, they both companies have uh, issued uh, press reports showing. Uh, very high protective efficacy in those age groups. Uh, that's with the same vaccine dosage that uh, we administer to older uh, adolescents and adults. And I anticipate that in the in the coming months, we're going to see an emergency use authorization for children uh, 12 years and older. And I, I think that's going to come uh, before the school year. Um, the, I know the Food and Drug Administration wanted so, somewhat longer follow-up in uh, children receiving that, these vaccines, um, just to be absolutely sure that they're safe and that there are no later adverse events associated with these vaccines. Now, both uh, for Pfizer and Moderna, they have uh, begun enrollment uh, of younger children. We're going to see that six years to 12 years of age group uh, come next, and then uh, children uh, as, as young as six months uh, to six years of age. So it's going to be done in phases. However, I don't anticipate that we're going to see an emergency use authorization, much less an approval for children un younger than 12 years of age before uh, 2022. I think that's going to come probably in, in early, uh, hopefully first quarter uh, 2022, when we're going to be, be able to vaccinate that, that younger population. Thanks, Bill. And this next question is, is a topic that I, I know many of us um, face and are grappling with. How do you recommend talking to family and friends who, for any number of reasons, may be reluctant to get vaccinated? 
Yes, yeah, so a very also a very important question, and and it's a complex one. But I'll try to give a a brief answer to it. Um, you know, first of all, uh, we need to think about vaccine hesitancy as a spectrum. Um, there are some people who are just very adamant. Um, uh, they're very against vaccines in general, or or against these vaccines in particular. Um, and there's there's really no amount of information or discussion that's going to change their views, but. Uh, a lot of people fall along that spectrum um, and for very justifiable reasons. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, there are people who have uh, mistrust or are skeptical of these vaccines um, across uh, uh, age groups, across uh, uh, genders, across political views. Um, and so it's not a, 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 this homogeneous or monolithic uh, group of people. And because of that, it's the, the first thing is to, is to listen to what their concerns are, listen to their questions. Um, and many times, uh, oftentimes, uh, these are justifiable concerns, uh, and they have real questions. Um, and you know, sometimes uh, there is misinformation or, and disinformation around these vaccines, and and one can try to uh, you know certainly provide the facts uh, and address those the misinformation. But I think the most important thing is to listen carefully to what the concerns are, what their questions are. Are, try to answer them in a dialogue, uh, you know, at a, at a populate, you know, in a community, it's very important that those people who are trusted within a community uh, be the voice. Uh, the, in, in this case, that, you know, it, it's not just about the message, it's about the messenger. And, you know, that can be healthcare providers, that can be uh, religious and church leaders. Uh, those are the people who are trusted in, in a number of communities. They understand what the concerns are, whether that comes out of historical mistrust of, of government and, and science, or whether it's something specifically related to uh, COVID-19 vaccines and maybe about the, the speed at which uh, these have been developed. Um, so those are some of the, I think, a key approaches to addressing uh, vaccine hesitancy, listening and, and having the right messengers. Thanks, Bill. Since we are um, just about at time, that's going to be the last word for today's town hall. I'd like to thank Heidi Conway and Bill Moss for joining me today and also give a big thank you to everyone who joined us and especially to those who submitted questions for Heidi and Bill to answer. This town hall will be archived and available for viewing, and I hope you've enjoyed the session. Please remember the COVID vaccine helps to protect us and our communities. Thanks, and stay safe.